further or, or in other words it's a super spreader event it spread to a large number of people and that's essentially how a genetic lineage emerges now if you if you if you look at the vertical points in time which are essentially points in time right if the virus was transmitting at a constant rate you would have an equal proportions of all of these genetic lineages because uh, the rate of transmission is constant and the rate of mutation is a constant then the distribution of each of the genetic lineages at any point of time should have been constant but that's not what we see and what we see is essentially a skewed distribution as you see here in the second vertical uh, uh, panel out here which essentially suggests that there have been some points where there have been super spreader events or emergence events which give rise to a particular genetic lineage and this is essentially what is really important because given the constant rate of mutation and given the constant time of transmission you can sort of predict not just where did this emergence event occur but also be able to track both in time and space how and where did this happen now people have done this remarkably over the uh, course of the pandemic and this is essentially from the early pandemic uh, up till around april from over uh, 2000 odd genomes which are available from across the world from many different countries and what you see here is largely the genetic lineages at that point in time could be distributed into 10 genetic lineages um uh, as you see here with marked with different colors but of course some of the genetic lineages were disproportionately larger than the other lineage the the big uh, blue blob that you see in the in the top panel of this chart is essentially a genetic lineage what we call as a a2a which essentially had a european uh, sort of ancestry now this is useful because early in the epidemic each of these genetic lineages did have some kind of a geographical preponderance with the a group mostly from the eastern part of the world the b group mostly from china and southeast asia and so on and so forth so therefore early in the epidemic this is also useful to understand where uh, uh, from where did this virus come into a country or what we call as introductions into a particular population but of course as we move later many of these events would change and therefore you could look at the dynamics of each of these genetic lineages and also make useful assessments about the progression of the disease or the pandemic uh, across in time and space now of course by doing genomics you can of course understand the evolution of the pathogen you can understand the origin of infection both in time and space and also able to understand emergence events or outbreak events apart from a lot of other things like evaluating diagnostics or even rational design of diagnostics and of course looking at vaccines and therapies i'll briefly touch upon uh, these points later in, in my slide now of course to do sequencing you need to do uh, sequencing at high throughput and that's what has been made possible uh, this revolution in genomics for sars cov2 today we have close to around 200000 genome sequences of sars cov2 and almost doubling every other month and one of these techniques that is also initially standardized in our lab has been this approach called as covid seq which can sequence any, anything from 300 to 3000 samples in 24 hours and at a quite remarkable accuracy and cost and when we come back to india you, we have a, at this moment close to around 4000 or genomes sequenced and deposited from multiple different laboratories across the country from multiple different states and across multiple different funding or uh, uh, organizational structures including hospitals research institutes individual laboratories so and so forth and what you see from india is not really 10 different lineages 10 different lineages are found across the world in india we find only 6 out of these 10 genetic lineages and apart from that we have a unique genetic lineage marked here in violet which we call as the i or the a3i plate now as you see here in a, in a factor of time the i or the a3i emerged in india sometime in early march or late february and sort of became a predominant genetic lineage at least in some states uh, as you see here but nevertheless even today the largest genetic lineage in terms of the numbers is the a2a genetic lineage which essentially traces its ancestry from europe so 
In summary, India has a quite unique or distinct genetic lineage, which is called the IA3I. Now, we could really trace back IA3I lineage from, uh, uh, from India across different periods in time and across different states, thanks to sequences which are, which are made available by different laboratories in each of these states. And what you find is quite a remarkable difference in the predisposition of the preponderance of these particular genetic lineage in different parts of India. Now, this is from early uh, April, May, where you see a large proportion of genomes from Telangana, Delhi, and some, some ways Tamil Nadu and Karnataka belong to this particular genetic lineage, which is quite distinctly unique to India. And I say distinctly unique to India, it doesn't really mean that it emerged or, or it, it, was, it, it was first found in India. It is also found in many other southern, Southeast Asian countries and, of course, some countries in the Asia Pacific, including Australia. Uh, but nevertheless, in none of these countries, it has, it has become a quite distinct and large lineage. What we also could track in time and space is that the emergence of IA3I occurred from a super spreader event uh, late in February, early March, where it has spread to multiple different states. As you see here in the right panel, there are multiple different states colored in different colors, but nevertheless, all tracing its origin from almost a single point event of emergence. So in other words, we know this has happened through a super spreader event. What we could also do using the genome sequence, as I said, you could trace lineages and genetic mutations or mutational fingerprints. You could now trace the transmission of the virus from across country as a factor of space and time. In other words, you can trace how from each of these cities, the virus has actually moved with people who are infected to another city and so on and so forth, and how did the dynamics change over time. And the other question, of course, you could think, and what we show is that IA3I had a quite significantly lower rate of substitution compared to the predominantly uh, prevalent uh, A2A clade in India. And what we sort of uh, understood from this low prevalence was that eventually it, uh, the IA3I would ha have a fitness disadvantage because it evolves much slower and then therefore would die out eventually. And that's what we have seen over time uh, for this particular player in the lineage. And of course, there are multiple other applications for looking at genome sequencing. And one of the important applications of looking at genome sequencing is to be able to understand the efficacy of diagnostics and, of course, in some cases, be able to rationally decide uh, or design diagnostic reagents. Now, coming to diagnostics, real time PCR is one of the mainstays for diagnosis of uh, SARS CoV 2. And the principle of real-time PCR is essentially polymerase chain reaction, where you have a primer or a probe which can actually bind to the genome of SARS-CoV-2, identify them, and amplify a small piece of uh, uh, nucleic acid, which is which is probed by a probe with a fluorescent label. Now, all of this is dependent upon the thermodynamics of uh, the DNA-DNA hybrids, and then therefore genetic mutations in these hybrids could affect thermodynamics of binding or detection and therefore the efficacy of the reagent. So you, what you could do is to essentially map all known primers and probes uh, from genomes available uh, across the world and ask this question, are there frequent genetic mutations in these sites which can bind to primers and probes? And using that, how can you sort of prioritize genetic reagents for, uh, uh, for testing? Or in other words, you could also use the same principle to go back and look at regions in the genome which are unlikely to have genetic mutations, and then therefore be able to design better reagents which are immune to genetic mutations at their sites. So this is what we have done, uh, not just for the Indian genomes, but of course, also for genomes across the world, and uh, this is published uh, quite recently. And before I close, what's really more important in the recent times is that uh, you, people develop uh, an immune mechanism to sort of contain the virus, and that's really important uh, in, in sort of containing the pandemic moving forward. Either people could have immunity after an infection or immunity after uh, getting a vaccine. But nevertheless, both of them are reliant on the two arms of the immune system. One is a humoral immune system, which is modulated by B cells, which make antibodies. And the other arm is essentially the T cells, which, uh, which mediated the cell-mediated immunity. 
Now coming to antibodies, antibodies essentially recognize a particular region in the protein structure or protein sequence, what we call as epitopes or what we call as another word, antigen. Now there could be two, two scenarios when we talk about antibody mediated response. One is a scenario where an individual has enough neutralizing antibodies and a scenario where we could have low or no neutralizing antibodies. In that particular case, an individual could be susceptible to an infection. In the first case, you could actually measure it to zero surveillance. And my next speaker will essentially delve deeper into zero surveillance. The other aspect is whether you could have a mutation in the antigens or the epitopes, which can actually change the recognition pattern for the identification by antibodies or like antibodies. And then therefore, these viruses could then escape immune recognition because the antibodies recognize a particular motif or a particular region in, in three-dimensional three space. And if you change the three-dimensional space, the antibody is not able to recognize that particular antigen anymore. And then therefore, the vaccine could escape. Now, incidentally, there are a significant large number of antibody escape mutations now available in public domain. Uh, we have one of the largest curated list of such mutations across genomes. Now, one of the applications of this understanding in genomics is that you should be able to go back and look at very few cases of reinfection to a SARS-CoV-2 in individuals. Now, reinfections essentially means that an individual had an infection, uh, had contained the virus by his immune system, but then the, after some, uh, quite some time, typically three to six months, it gets reinfected by another, another SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, one of the first reports of SARS-CoV-2 reinfection in the country were actually uh, uh, reported by us, where we showed uh, there was a significant difference in the genetic mutations between the two viruses in the two episodes. So this is two, for two individuals, two healthcare workers who had reinfections. And the panel essentially shows the points at which the genomes have changed for these two infections. And what's really more important is to now go back and understand what does this genetic mutation do in terms of immune escape. At least in one of these cases, we know one of the mutations is because of immune escape. It's a very well documented mutation. I think I'll stop there uh, and uh, hand over to the next speaker. But before that, we acknowledge a lot of people which made this possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vinod. It was uh, fascinating. Um, I think now um, we'll shift to Dr. Shantanu. I mean, I'm sure he's going to be speaking on uh, zero survey. Uh, which people are looking up to. Thank you. I'm trying to I think uh, I think there's a present screen. I mean, you can share. Yeah, I have done the present now, but there is. It's not somehow showing up. Can we do one thing? In that case, uh, can we um, request uh, Dr. Chakravarti? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Chakravarti, please. Yeah. yeah. So, you. I hope you can see my screen. No, yeah, very clear. No, you can go for. Uh, so, yeah. And now, can you see the slide? Yeah, perfect. Okay, good. So, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak today. Um, uh, I'll touch upon a little bit about our work in CRISPR diagnostics for SARS-CoV-2, and. Uh, mm, I heard that this one is uh, predominantly meant for uh, school children and young students and graduates. So we'll try to keep it uh, simple uh, for, for everyone's understanding. Uh, and the title of my talk today is Leveraging CRISPR for SARS-CoV-2 Diagnostics. So 
you know the one of the beneficial effects of the pandemic uh, that we have all seen and it's also on display today as we speak is that uh, it has met uh, it has actually made science uh, reach the homes of a lot of people which under normal circumstances uh, do not uh, in normal conditions and that is why terms such as crispr some terms such as vaccines all these things are being discussed uh, and, and and people on the streets know what an rt pcr machine is what uh, a diagnostic means uh, this is a is a kind of championing of science because uh, these things are sometimes kind of um, moved to regions which are considered to be too complex to understand but uh, due to the pandemic and due to the need to understand them better uh, there is more discussions happening about them like never before so crispr uh, as a tool as a technique is uh, one such a term which has also now become a household name more because of the nobel prize that it has received in chemistry in 2020 uh, to 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 fascinating scientists emmanuel charpentier and jennifer etudna for the development of a method for gene editing i purposefully put here that the field of crispr has two heroes of course these are two um, amazing biochemists who have actually done monumental work but uh, like a lot of different fields uh, generally a field does not simply have two heroes so therefore one can almost edit this two out which is what the crispr does is and put several heroes here because the field itself has seen um, uh, tremendous developments over almost 30 40 years to come to the point uh, where we are talking about editing the human genome and somebody put this up on twitter after the nobel prize was announced uh, giving some idea about who are the people who have you know over several years have contributed to this field and as you can see starting from uh, the early days in the 80s till the current developments that are still happening uh, a lot of people uh, who have actually contributed to different aspects of genome editing and uh, funnily enough the probably the the most um, uh, you know the significant contributions to this has been made by a virus or a bacteria or the archae which actually constitute the basis of crispr which is the immune system in bacteria now i told you that vaccines and immunity have become a very commonplace thing for discussion in nowadays in households but it was almost unbelievable to think that a very simple organism of course now we can't even call them simple anymore uh, but a bacterial cell actually has a very sophisticated mode of immunity and that is the uh, basis or the blueprint for crispr and this immunity is actually being developed against a virus therefore the virus also has a very important role to play so let us understand a little bit about what this you know immunity is all about you we have read in textbooks we had know that when we are uh, exposed to some kind of an antigen or a, some kind of a foreign substance then our body develops some sort of resistance or it develops an arsenal of weapons so that if there is a future attack by the same substance then it can launch a response to that so scientists thought that this was a very sophisticated uh, way of handling um, you know pathogenic microorganisms uh, that that humans have evolved into but it was a complete surprise to them that bacteria also have a similar kind of adaptive immunity within them and this is what uh, is called uh, the the uh, you know the crispr pathway as you see over here this is a bacterial cell a bacteria is attacked by viruses these viruses are often called bacteriophages and the virus tries to put its genetic material inside the bacteria and this genetic material most of the times they get integrated into the bacterial genome at a very precise position uh, often called the crispr locus and then the bacteria almost acts like a librarian so when you have a new book that comes into the library you try to put a tag on it so that you make sure that next time somebody wants to issue that book you can look at the number which is present in that tag and recall that so the bacteria is so smart that it is able to put a some kind of a small tag on a very tiny piece of viral dna which it introduces into its own genome so it actually introduces a foreign piece of dna into its own genome puts a tag on it of some kind that's a molecular tag so that it knows that in a second attack by the same virus uh, it would have a memory of that virus okay so uh, to put that into a molecular terms uh, when this 
same virus attacks the bacteria a second time as you can see on the right side of the of the cartoon on the top the bacteria uses the information of the genetic element of that old um, uh, invasion of that virus and it converts that dna of, of that virus into rna complexes and uh, or makes an assembly of protein and rna which is called the crispr rna complex or crispr rnp complex ribonucleoprotein complex and this entire ribonucleoprotein complex then fetches the uh, invading bacteriophages dna and sits on it and chops it into pieces thereby it eliminates the attack so it used the old information of that same viral attack to ward off new attacks by that bacteriophage so it's an extremely sophisticated and very advanced form of immunity that bacteria seem to be showing let us have a look at how uh, this uh, this uh, you know this looks like in a normal uh, uh, kind of uh, scenario through a through a small movie over here what uh, uh, i would also introduce in the next slide is what are the main players of this whole immunity so as you could have you might have seen in the last slide that there are certain terms that have been introduced over here which is called crispr then you have heard uh, crrna then you have also heard something called cas or you see something called cas so cas compose is is basically a group of proteins uh, which along with the rna component they form a complex and then they go and bind to the the bacteriophage dna and then cuts it into pieces so this is how this uh, this happens so these are the bacteriophages which actually look a little bit like alien spaceships they are introducing their foreign uh, dna into the bacterial cell uh, it goes through the bacterial membrane and this is the viral dna and uh, since the bacteria already has an immune system against it so it immediately brings in a small rna piece which uh, there are a couple of pieces of RNA where they get together and they form a complex with this Cas protein or a Cas9 protein uh, to be more precise. And this complex now goes and tries to search if it has found some kind of similarity with that RNA uh, with the new DNA of the virus. If it finds that similarity, then it cuts that DNA. So now the, bacteri the bacteriophage DNA is cut, so it is uh, rendered inactive. So that's how the the immunity in the in the in the bacteria actually takes place by. Now, what scientists have been smart enough is to understand that this whole complex or this whole process can actually be artificially introduced into a human cell. So once it goes into a human cell, uh, and you preferentially tell that you know this is the RNA sequence. Uh, this RNA sequence can go and bind to a same sequence on the human DNA if present, and if if the human DNA contains the same sequence, then the human DNA is also cleaved or cut in the same manner as the bacteriophage DNA. Now, the thing with the human DNA is that uh, it also has a very, uh, you know, sophisticated mode of repair. So once the DNA is cut, it doesn't allow, the human cell doesn't allow it to remain in the cut form. It tries to, you know, break, uh, the, to seal these, these ends. And therefore, the DNA breaks are kind of repaired. So oftentimes the repair is very non-specific and it makes mistakes. But in uh, most cases, uh, if there is a possibility of having an additional template of a correct DNA sequence, like you see over here, which has some amount of homology or some amount of similarity, then this particular piece of DNA can get introduced into that broken piece. And therefore you would have a targeted insertion of a gene. And this you can do in different types of cells. You can do this in uh, different types of organisms in a single cell, such as even in a in a germline cell or in a in a non-germline cell, or even in a, to make transgenic animals or so. So the advantage of it is that you can actually make whatever changes that you want to make in the DNA of an organism using this technology, which is called the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. So just to summarize the basis of CRISPR technology where a double standard break is actually repaired and in the process of the repair you have this um, kind of um, uh, introduction of a foreign DNA piece and this is therapeutically very very relevant because it actually uh, means that if there is a mutation which a person uh, has such as for example a BRCA1 mutation causing breast cancer then one can put a, a correct copy of the gene in that site and then repair that and therefore one can be able to theoretically cure that disease. So coming from that uh, background, let us hear a little bit about how we have uh, actually
we use this system uh, in Feluda, which is a, a type of diagnostics, you know, we, which has been developed at CSIR IGIB. Uh, and this work has been done with Dr. Shobhik Maitri, is also in the in the panel today. Uh, who uh, with uh, and we both both mine and Dr. Shobhik, we have a, have a almost like a big joint lab, uh, which where we work on uh, elucidating different aspects of uh, biophysics and biochemistry of CRISPR proteins. So how did we come up with the idea of COVID-19 detection? As you might uh, know that, you know, the type of COVID-19 tests, uh, which Dr. Vinod had touched a little bit upon, uh, there are three major ways by which COVID-19 uh, or the SARS-CoV-2 virus is actually detected. Uh, and they actually are answered, uh, are, are basically their detection answers different types of questions. So if one does a nucleic acid test, which is uh, also considered to be the gold standard test for active infection, uh, uh, then you do what is called a quantitative real-time PCR test most commonly. Uh, and the viral RNA is detected after a conversion into DNA and amplification using a kind of probe which goes and binds to the DNA. The second type of test which often uh, are, is heard about uh, in a lot of places is the antigen test, which basically looks for viral proteins. Uh, this is uh, again a direct test which is looking at the infection of the virus in the current sample. Unfortunately, detection of proteins and detection of uh, nucleic acids do not follow the same principle of amplification. Um, because of a technology called PCR, it is possible to amplify DNA several fold, which means that even if there is very tiny amount of viral, viral material, genetic material present in a sample, in order to see it or detect it, one can amplify it several fold and then do the detection. Uh, unfortunately, protein amplification doesn't happen uh, in a straightforward manner and therefore antigen tests have a lack of sensitivity although it is very highly specific sensitivity is a measure of how often would you actually detect a viral particle if it is present even in a very tiny copies uh, the third test is of course the antibody test which looks at the prevalence of a virus in a community and it is not always uh, talking about the current infection status but rather about past infection and Dr. Shantanu will talk more in details of how important that is for community medicine. Um, CRISPR has entered in this field because as I showed you in the last few slides is that it relies on a protein going and interacting with genetic material and therefore the COVID-19 scenario has actually brought up a large number of CRISPR tests or CRISPR based tests which utilize majorly three different types of proteins. One is the Cas9 protein, the other is the Cas12 and the third one is the Cas13 protein. Now the Cas12 and the Cas9 proteins actually interact with DNA and therefore their readout is direct DNA based. The Cas13 protein interacts with RNA, so it can interact with the viral RNA, but it also goes through a first uh, step of RT-PCR in which it is converted into DNA, amplified, and then an in vitro transcription is done to make more RNA and then the Cas13 based reporter cleavage is, uh, is used. Among this, Feluda actually uses an alternate form of Cas9 called Francisilla Novicida Cas9, which we have been working extensively on in the lab in IGIB. And this principle of Feluda is that this particular Cas9 protein, uh, which is FN Cas9, is highly specific to point mutations in terms of discriminating between two substrates that are different by a single mismatch. So if you tell this protein that you need to distinguish between two DNA pieces which are different by a single mismatch, match then there is a specific guideline uh, in the design parameter which if one implements then any two pieces of dna or rna can be successfully distinguished and the readout can be of different kinds whether it could be a gel signature or a paper-based strip and we have done this uh, on different types of samples on different uh, types of diseases and uh, different types of readout and we found that not only is it able to do uh, such kind of disease detection very, very, very robustly, but also it can identify carriers of mutation, which is generally uh, one of the challenging tasks, um, which uh, in through non-sequencing based approaches, uh, where if one of the alleles is mutated and 50% of the, uh, you know, 50% of the uh, sample is having the mutation and the other 50% is not, uh, the Feluda can actually be able to discriminate uh, that as well. And it also doesn't require any kind of uh, PAM sequence, which is a, 
again a CRISPR terminology, won't go into details into that. So it can essentially be used for detecting any DNA or RNA mutation that is present uh, in any genome. And uh, an interesting study where we could actually see this being used to distinguish between two bacterial strains of Helicobacter pylori differing by a, a mismatch, single mismatch, uh, which causes rifampicin resistance or rifampicin sensitive type of uh, peptic ulcer. And uh, normally these kind of studies take about three days to confirm in a in an OPD uh, where uh, you know you have to grow them in, in these plates and understand whether the the person can be administered the antibiotic or not uh, using. Feluda and the and the uh, RPA technology, this can actually be done in almost 30 minutes uh, without the need for going through the culturing. So we had been doing all this uh, for uh, doing sickle cell anemia detection on the field uh, before the COVID-19 actually struck. Where you can see that currently uh, the the solubility test is a very crude test that the government actually generally conducts in screening camps across uh, different villages and tertiary healthcare centers where a blood prick is taken and the solubility is measured. Uh, it doesn't really tell very accurately about the uh, zygosity or about the disease status. And since it takes blood, as you can see over here, there are tiny kids coming in the school to give blood and some of them are not too thrilled about the prospect of having their, their uh, you know, finger pricked as this uh, tiny kid over here. So what we realize is that if we convert all this into a simple uh, tube where the patient or the kid can be asked to simply spit into and uh, you have the right reagents which can lies open the cells, the DNA comes out and the feruda can be done within 30 to 40 minutes, then this entire process becomes much more user friendly. So we were doing this uh, on a trial basis in uh, different patients with different patients and different patient samples when of course the COVID-19 started and uh, we kind of quickly adapted this to actually use Feluda for detecting SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the pipeline is shown over here. The initial, since it's, uh, it's the detection is being done by CRISPR, the initial step happens like a regular PCR. In this case, the RT-PCR here stands for reverse transcription PCR, where the RNA is converted into DNA. Uh, and uh, then the, this RT-PCR uh, is done using biotin labeled primers which generate amplicons or PCR amplicons which have biotin at both sides and then combining that with paper strip chemistry one can have a readout where uh, two bands on a strip actually makes uh, uh, sure that this is actually a positive patient whereas a single band which is the control band tells that this is a negative uh, sample. The entire process can be done within an hour and because it doesn't require a quantitative real-time PCR machine which costs about 20 lakhs uh, but a regular PCR machine which costs something close to almost 70,000 to 80,000 rupees, one can scale up testing by almost 20 fold at the same site at the cost of a QRT PCR machine. And with more innovations, uh, the timing as well as the number of steps have also been reduced, which we are not going into details. Uh, again, there has been sufficient uh, combination of CRISPR biology and paper strip chemistry. Like I mentioned, some of this has been brought in uh, by Dr. Shobik Maiti, whose experience in nucleic acid biophysics really helped in taking this ahead. But the net uh, result is that this is how uh, strips look like for positive samples and a control. And uh, negative control and negative samples uh, is what, what this looks like here. Uh, we we looked at the entire SARS-CoV-2 uh, you know, genome. Dr. Vinod very nicely gave an idea about how the sequences and the regions and the mutations in the virus makes a very important uh, role to play, uh, or uh, you know, it it has a very important role to play in detecting the sensitivity and specificity of uh, uh, of the of the diagnostic device uh, so we have been doing this as well and we are continuously doing this in trying to figure out which are the best regions in the genome which should actually be targeted taking into account the crispr specific parameters uh, and also the parameters for uh, making sure that we can detect up to almost a few uh, hundred or a few tens of copies of the viral genome and because we are both bengal in this in this team and Feluda is of course the name of a Bengali detective. If you are aware of, of the Ray stories, Satyajit Ray stories, uh, he's generally assisted by uh, two 
uh, assistants. One is, of course, his uh, cousin called Topshe. Uh, we made a smartphone app with Aduvo uh, based in Chennai, which can do all this, uh, you know, quantification. And uh, it is a machine learn learning uh, app. Uh, and and the final readout uh, using just a smartphone device. And Jatayu, or the junction for the analysis of your ta target design of your Feduda assay, is a web server uh, freely available where any nucleotide sequence can actually be put in and one can uh, you know, get the Feluda primers and the final uh, design of your Feluda experiment because it is not just limited to SARS-CoV-2 but any nucleotide uh, detection or nucleotide mismatch uh, or SNP detection can be, uh, can be attempted using Feluda. Uh, just the last slide before I finish, of course, uh, you know, we have talked about the first version of Feluda, which has been uh, licensed to Tata Science and then which became Tata Medical and Diagnostics. It's out in the field. The last uh, information we received that it's being uh, being done in, in Delhi. Uh, but there are also uh, versions that we have been working on uh, making it better, where all this can be now combined in a single pot, in a single tube, uh, which we call as the RTRPA Feluda reaction, uh, where it doesn't even require uh, any kind of PCR machine, but a very small heat block. Uh, and in the most uh, recent version, even that heat block can actually be eliminated, giving rise to uh, a possibility of testing uh, at a much more wider scale and closer to home, uh, so that a return to homes, return to schools can be made possible in the in the in the coming months. Uh, and of course, the most important slide, there are a large number of people who have to be thanked for, for the work that has gone uh, into this. And, uh, you know, we are very generously uh, funded from different um, different agencies. So if there are any questions, I can either take them now or after the after the uh, discussion. Yeah, I think what we'll do is um, uh, Dr. Shantanu will speak and then uh, maybe we'll take okay. the questions. Thank you so much. Uh, it was enlightening. Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Shantanu Singh Gupta ji? Yeah, we can see. Ashantanu, I mean, you may have to unmute. Yeah. Yes. Uh, is the screen visible? Perfect. Perfectly fine. Yeah. So uh, we have uh, uh, just heard about uh, how genomics has been used uh, in in SARS-CoV-2, and then. Uh, Devojyoti gave a very nice uh, presentation on how they have developed a diagnostics to detect Feluda. So, uh, today I'll talk about uh, sero survey. So, what do we do in sero survey? So, we actually measure the antibodies in the blood of an individual. So, I understand that there are a lot of uh, school children here. So, uh, in their interest, so what is an antibody? So antibodies are actually soldiers of our body. You know, whenever any invader, in this case, it can be virus, bacteria, or any parasite, when they invade our body, our body, body's immune cells immediately sends some signals. And on basis of that signals, there are proteins, glycoproteins, which are known as antibodies that are produce, produced. So what does antibody do? Antibody, it, and we know showed this is a Y-shaped protein. It, it goes and binds to the antigen and then helps to process the anti, uh, uh, virus and eliminate the virus from the system. So it is actually a defense mechanism. And what happens is once the antibody is there, then you're, you're supposed to be protected. But nobody knows how long you are protected. So there are various kinds of antibodies. Actually, there are five different kinds of antibodies. They are designated as IgM, IgA, IgG, IgE, and IgD. So IgM is the first antibody that is produced by the body. And it is the first line of defense. So if you see in this slide, so this is where an infection, a, a person is infected the symptom starts coming where the virus load uh, increases. So if you can see this, the virus load increases here. And, uh, and after that, after the symptoms come after a month or uh, a, a week or so, 
So once once the, vi uh, the virus load is high, you start getting symptoms, and then during seven or eight days after the virus entry, the IgM in, in this case the red bar here, the IgM antibodies are generated. But they are, they don't last for very long. They they generally subside within three to four weeks. The IgA antibodies also simultaneously come. They stay for a little bit more. But then after about ten to fourteen days of the infection, IgG antibodies start coming in, and they last for a very long time. So this is no this was known for any virus, but nobody had an idea. Of what was going on in case of uh, SARS CoV-2 virus, so uh, so when the when the uh, SARS infection started, an interest on how long the virus will be stable, will there be an infection? So, for example, you when there is a virus load, you you generally get symptoms, but it was seen that lot of people without any symptoms also have de uh, developed antibodies, which means that there was the virus. They did not get any remarkable symptoms, but yet they were actually infected. So it is very important to understand the prevalence of these antibodies to, to actually assess what is the load of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection in our population. It's also important to understand how long will the antibodies be in our system, which will help in protection against reinfection. So based on that, we, we undertook a study, uh, we, uh, which is a pan-India study, where we collected blood samples from all the 38 CSIR laboratories in, in the country. And uh, we looked at their antibody levels. And we basically asked two questions. Do you have antibodies against SARS-CoV-19? And if, if yes, how long will the antibody persist? So in the month of June, we started the serology we completed the first phase in September, and now we are following up all the people who were antibody positive for every three months. So we are just ready with our first phase data. And what we have seen is the zero positivity pan India is about 10.1%. Remember, we, we, there were lots of reports about herd immunity. Herd immunity is when a large section of the population is already infected and has developed antibodies. That's where when we call herd immunity, so the chances of being infected becomes low. But that herd immunity is generally uh, generally comes when you have almost 60 to 70 percent zero positivity across the country. But if you see the data from September, it's only about 10 percent. In some some uh, cases, which which are marked in green, the the rates are high. So, for example, in certain pockets of Delhi, it was 25%. Certain pockets of Hyderabad, it was about 30%. But overall, the seropositivity was only 10%, which means that we are still far, far, far away from what is known as herd immunity. And we need to have vaccines to generate this, uh, this kind of herd immunity. And in most of the cases, if you see these red bars, these are the places at that time, so in the month of September, for example, Trivandrum, Tiruvannathapuram, Goa, Palampur, Dehradun, Nagpur, Bhuvaneshwar, these had seropositivity of less than 5%, which means that we predicted that if the seropositivity of a place is low, the infections are bound to rise in near future. And that's exactly we did an analysis. We looked at the uh, infectivity uh, infection rates 30 days before our zero survey and 30 days after our zero survey. If you can see here the red uh, circles, these, this is Dehradun, Nagpur, uh, your Pilani in Rajasthan, uh, Palampur in uh, Himachal Pradesh, Assam, Lucknow. These all places had very low zero positivity when we started, less than five, uh, five to seven percent. And after 30 days, we saw that there is a huge increase in uh, cases. So actually, low seropositivity is a marker for increased risk of future transmission of the virus. So this is one very important aspect of seropositivity 
is that if you do a community based sero positivity you can probably have an indication of what is going to come in a month's time or couple of months time whether the the infection of a particular place is going to plateau or whether it is going to rise or whether it is going to fall the sero positivity or serology experiments can tell you that the the other important thing that that sero positive uh, serology assays can tell you is uh, how long you are protected and what we have found although i'm not showing here is at least till 3 months the antibodies are uh, are present and we have found in certain cases even up to 6 months the antibodies are there so once the antibodies are generated for 3 to 6 months you are so called protected which if if you have uh, heard what vinod said if the strain changes then again uh, you might have uh, you might get uh, be reinfected and we have seen uh, about 10 15 cases all over the world where reinfection has been reported due to a different strain but from the same strain you once you have generated the antibody you can be rest assured that you are protected for for at least a few days till the antibodies are there in the system and this in this project we are going to follow people every 3 months and see how long this is uh, uh, the antibodies are there which means you are protected and this is one of the important strategies in vaccination also they if you have a vaccine once you are vaccinated you generate antibodies and it is one important to understand how long will these antibodies last in your system for example in case of influenza people have seen that the antibodies last for a year so you know influenza vaccines are always given every year similarly there are other diseases in which antibodies probably last a little bit more longer 2 3 years so we because sars cov 2 is a new disease we have no idea how the how much long the antibodies will last so that is one of the things that serology uh, sero survey will help it's helping now and specially it will help when the vaccine comes the other uh, way that uh, sero uh, serology will help is prioritizing people to whom vaccine should be given for example we are a country of 1.4 billion people and we will not be able to give vaccine to so many people in one shot so we need to prioritize and you have heard from uh, you have heard in uh, television or read in the newspaper government has already come up with a strategy of whom they are going to give the vaccine first so healthcare workers people are who are in the front line and then uh, people who interact with lot of other people they are going to get the vaccines but one of the ways to further prioritize is to look at the serology so if a person has already got an antibody the person may not, may not be the right candidate for giving vaccine in the first phase so so that way sero survey will be uh, very important and this is more important because we have seen from our study that about 75% of people who have developed antibodies are actually asymptomatic they did not have any symptoms so prioritization based on sero sero survey probably is going to be one of the most important thing uh, to to uh, allow us to uh, manage the uh, the uh, whom to be, uh, the vaccine should be given in the first stage and who can be given later on so this will aid vaccination strategy so with that i would like to end and i'm uh, here to answer your any questions that you have i would like to thank all the coordinators from all the csr lab and all the participants of uh, this uh, very large effort we have collected almost 10000 samples from the entire country and we are following it up every 3 months so this is a huge effort and it could not have been done without the help of all the laboratories all the directors of csi laboratories who who really uh, facilitated the study and we are really really thankful for them and uh, finally thank you so do we have questions now hello 
No, uh, we don't have any question. There is one question on uh, what are antigens, but uh, you have already described. Juma, is Kenneth sir around? Is Kenneth sir online? Yeah, Vinod sir is online. No, Kenneth sir. No, 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 he's not online. He's not online. Uh, uh, oh, okay, okay, you can go ahead with the questions or otherwise uh, I, I have some questions to them, uh, I'll come in. Uh, there is no such questions here, uh, just one question that uh, what are antigens? We know you want to answer that. Yeah, so uh, so antigens are, are broadly molecules which can elicit an immune response. And uh, uh, this could be either a humoral immune response or this could be either a cell immediate response. This could be a protein, this could be a small molecule. So anything that can elicit an immune response is what we call as an antigen. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Juma, I think uh, just uh, Kenneth Sarah sent me a message uh, that his <laughs> connection is off. So, oh. uh, uh, okay. so we will go ahead as scheduled and uh, I have a few questions for all of them. Uh, probably the kind of condensed presentation all of them have given. We will have one hour or so to uh, interact with them if you want to understand the response. Okay, okay. Uh, but uh, gross, we don't have much time, and uh, there is an. Can you all hear me? There is a lot of echo going on. Uh, so, uh, if someone can uh, switch off their microphone. Uh, am I audible now? Is it clear now? Yes. Okay. So uh, I'll just go about uh, some questions which are not that technical in nature. I, 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 when I first initiated the discussion about the program, I had a discussion was uh, with Dr. Maiti. Uh, I was interested about one thing. What could be the motivation? How did you at all think that uh, uh, this CRISPR can be used in diagnostics and therapeutics uh, and uh, you can try this uh, uh, with this particular pandemic as well? What was the trigger? What is the particular trigger that you got into this line? Uh, because sometimes I understand talking to the students uh, uh, that they look for such things uh, which can uh, make them scientists, which can make them interested in science. So, you and uh, uh, Dr. Maiti also can please come in and uh, talk about it. Tebu, go ahead and sir, you are part of the team. Uh, I think uh, I think you should take this. I have talked enough. <laughs> please go ahead. <laughs> okay, so basically we are working on you know developing CRISPR-Cas technology for past two years so uh, in this program basically we are involved uh, how to correct sickle cell anemia disease so that is a uh, mission mode project uh, by government of india we are part of it so during this project executions uh, we visited the disease affected area mainly in chhatrisgarh around raipur and bilaspur when we visited the affected area in the re, uh, you know remote villages of this state, what we have understood the major problem may be therapeutics, but also the diagnostics. So diagnostics basically what for sickle cell anemia may be solubility. You can tell that whether the patient, uh, whether any individual is affected or not, but you cannot distinguish whether you know carriers versus you know the disease patient and the you know individual distinguishing so we thought that genotypic uh, identification is necessary and it is also necessary to give on site otherwise you know once you have identified a person is a disease but you do not know uh, whether they are you know carriers or trait so after a few days if you ask them to report or to follow up it is very difficult because you know genotypic identification takes at this stage uh, at least seven to ten days 
so by this 10 days clinicians loses the contact of this patient who are not anymore traceable either phone or by any means so that was the motivation basically to start with a diagnostic which could be a kind of poc point of care you know you do within a few minutes few hours and come out with the result so you are working on that and uh, you know at the very beginning of the pandemic when it was hitting to you know it already hitted to china and it, it was hitting to other countries like european countries italy and uh, say maybe america so myself and devojyoti we are having tea in our tea club and we are discussing about you know this uh, covid 19 cases around the world and we thought that based uh, you know as it is a kind of virus and it has a genetic material we can come out or we can you know repurpose the test or diagnostics which we are you know uh, developing for sickle cell anemia so that was the trigger point it is a small discussion between us to person to scientist over a cup of tea and the demand which we realize that you know test could be a very important you know um, important uh, point uh, to taken care of and we have a te technology in our hand so all these things are actually you know uh, motivated us to convert this technology for covid 19 detections so that is the initiation that is fantastic and actually i wanted to come to this story because uh, uh, i feel quite often that uh, innovations uh, often happens uh, on casual discussions uh, uh, when you are connected to many other similar minded people you get a trigger and you get into something and then you delve deeper into it thank you so very much uh, one just practical question i'm requested to ask by one of our uh, viewers and that uh, is the is the Feluda test available now commercially and if not then when is it likely to uh, come to people so you know i have uh, the information as a public information which has got you know circulated in newspaper so it is available in our commercial partner is tata medical okay so as far you know news that they are basically giving uh test through uh their channel partner apollo in seven cities of our country that was published that was news uh, and uh, in november 9th so i believe you know it has been improved so many more you know a center has been identified so yeah uh, it is it is it is available in the market not each and every market each and every state because um, they, are, they are scaling up yeah okay. i can understand that so maybe that's one of the reason why i mean if you really look at from where we started um test per million and where are we now i mean we have come a bit, long way um and it was a fascinating discussion in the sense that uh, um, from understanding the the sars cov virus to actually sequencing it uh, and uh, you know using that sequence the genome sequence to understand what the virus is all about trying i mean to coming to a um, the Feluda test that all of you have done and the zero survey as to, to understand uh, uh, the whole uh, uh, geography of the country and how many people have been affected and uh, what the uh, the, the so-called uh, uh, the zero survey re has revealed I mean uh, in terms of uh, the herd humidity which we are talking about and hopefully things uh, uh, are uh, taking shape and vaccine is getting developed uh, um, and hopefully let's uh, I, I think we'll have uh, uh, we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and let's all hope that uh, this pandemic comes to an end at least by first i mean then uh, the first half of the next year uh, thank you so much and it's just one institution you know under the csir there are uh, labs across the country um, across different uh, icmr uh, csir uh, ministry of health everybody is working together and um, including tifr and things like that hopefully i mean this uh, challenge which has struck us very badly um in a way there are some spin-off benefits one is of course feluda and there could be many more and uh, we are also uh, excellent in terms of deliverables number of vaccines which we can touch rotavirus is a classic case where you know 
one of the Bharat vaccine or serum institute, they can come in large numbers. So thank you so much for sparing your uh, time um, with our uh, audience. I know there will be some questions uh, in the in the Facebook and uh, YouTube. Uh, we will keep answering them, and if there is any need, we will definitely get back to you and uh, maybe seek your advice and um, give them an answer. I think this is the beginning of a you know inter. Uh, um, institutional collaboration because we are a science museum science communicators we connect with the school and the college students uh, so we want the practicing scientists actually to come face to face with them to communicate this so once again on behalf of the neighbor science center i would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, all the four distinguished scientists dr Saumik maithi um, dr shantanu sen gupta and dr vinod askaria and uh, dr debo jyoti chakravarti and also uh, the your uh, science outreach uh, program dr purthi of the um, igib and the csir lab thank you so much sir, sir just before we go out sir hello can you hear me sir yes, Please yes. Tell me. Uh, just before we go out, can we all come on the screen together and uh, can Juma take a snapshot so that we can also record it? <laughs> Juma, are you there? She's having another yes, program. I don't... Oh, you're there. Please. Okay. <laughs> take a photograph. <laughs> so, all, all, all the scientists involved and uh, also the outreach coordinator who was working with us, we all can come together on the screen and have a common photograph. All of you, please switch on your videos as well. Can Zoom, you, you can have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And with Thank you. The Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a, so it's a pleasure. Another, another time, we'll get a little more time and have a longer discussion. Sure, sure. Thank we, you. We can collaborate in the same way and have program. Thank you. It's not an issue. We can bring many people and you know, reach to the students. Thank so, you. Thank you so much. Our, our outreach is also very active. They will be happy to join and you know work in collaboration with National Council of Science Media. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's your most welcome. Okay. Yeah. We'll yeah. Once again. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. Have a good day. Bye bye. -bye. Great Juma sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. And sign off. Yeah. Bye.